continuing our series here. So we're on part nine of 10 of the complete semi-slav. So um, we've been talking about this now for several weeks if you're new to the class. And tonight we're gonna look at the Moscow variation of the semi-slav. So we're gonna get this on the board right away. So we've been looking at this position for the, this is the ninth week now. Um, and we looked at e3, which is a big move. And lately we've been looking at the bishop to g5 move. And we spent a couple weeks looking at what happens when we take on c4. But tonight we're gonna focus on a different move, the move h6. Um, and this will finish up our, our course here. We're gonna look at two different moves in this position, one this week, one next week. This week we're gonna look at um, what happens, well you gotta do something with your bishop. So what happens when you take the knight, which isn't supposed to be as threatening. Uh, next week we're gonna look at what happens if you just retreat, which what often happens in these lines, just to give you a, a sneak peek, is you get these really wild positions where black tries to hold on to a pawn, but he has to push pawns on both sides of the board. We'll save the best for last, that'll be really complicated. Tonight will be more positional, so we're gonna look at the move bishop takes f6. This is our main focus for the knight. Okay, so we take back with the queen, and as we can already sort of see, there's already an imbalance. Now, at the top level, like the very top, they play the Moscow as white, kind of in an effort just to draw the game. So it's, for the top guys, this is like, you wanna draw with white, you play this, white's a little bit better, grind, equal, draw. But since it is an imbalance, I think players of all different levels might actually have a lot of chances to play for a win. Black, uh, his big advantage in this position is the two bishops. And white will try to make use of the fact that already he's sort of ahead in development. He's gonna try to open up the position immediately. He's gonna shoot for a move like e4 at some point, And he's gonna try to use his lead in development, create an initiative, and cause problems for black. Um, so black is just gonna try to hold on and then the end game might be good for him because he has two bishops. And it's, you know, it's a very solid position for black. So we're gonna see sort of that battle. So it is in this position, I guess it is worth mentioning what happens if we just play e4 right away. We'll, we'll come back to the main move, which is actually e3, and then they play bishop d3 in the castle. Um, this would be a really good move if black didn't actually have a pretty good response after taking on e4, taking on e4. Um, this would be good except for black has one annoying move. And that's bishop to b4 check. And, okay, it's so annoying that nobody at the top level has played this way as white. Some of them have had this position as black. And the problem for white is, well, we didn't really want to drop this guy back. We know like, we could go back, but the whole point of this was to have an active knight. Um, and either knight move, black can play the move c5 and it, it should be an okay game. Okay, this knight doesn't really deserve to go to d2 either. And some creative people have come up with a different solution for white. So you might be surprised what the main move is in this position. If it's not a knight move, and it's not queen to d2, some people in this position play king to e2. So very strange, but um, Kramnik has actually had the black side here twice. So people with respectable ratings have played this way as white. The idea, okay, obviously this looks very silly, g3, bishop g2, the rook can come over at some point, and your king can escape, and you castle by hand. So some people have tried to play this way, but I will just show uh, the beginning of a Kramnik game just to show how black can possibly get a very easy to play position. Okay, the queen was attacked, and often with the queen, we might want to retreat back to c7. Um, Kramnik's play here, the knight's attacked, so it's protected, is just uh, very simple. He gets all of his stuff, and over the next few moves, he can play here, then he can think of playing the e5 break. Um, and, you know, white still has to solve this problem. He needs to bring his rook over. And this is just very comfortable for black, so... Okay, most people don't play e4 right away in this variation. I do want to mention one other tricky move. Um, if white is still thinking about playing the move e4, you might consider a3. And you might consider queen to b3. So the idea is, now you don't have this square for your bishop. If we play e4 and we take twice on e4, well, now I've taken away this square. 
So sometimes white can play a5, and the idea is now in that line with e4 takes, knight takes, we do have bishop to b4 again. Um, but I do want to show a way that Anand played this position with black. Uh, we will show this game because it was actually kind of interesting. OK, so he just develops. And now after e4, he takes. Queen f4, sort of the same square. And in all of these lines we're going to see tonight, black is typically aiming for the move e5. And that's what we're going to see here in this type of position. So bishop d3, e5. OK, and in this game, which is uh, Belov Anand from 2015, white took here. Also, quite a good move is just a castle. And then we'll just play may continue like this. And you're just in time, so you get off the e file. Just in time, there's no good discoveries. This guy's hanging, but the knight doesn't have any good discovery. Um, and you'll get some sensible position kind of close to this. And OK, this sh should just be a fine position for black. But let's look at this game, because it's actually quite interesting um, what happened. So they didn't castle in the game. They took immediately on e5. That was Belov's move. Takes, takes. OK, and white, again, is thinking about putting rooks on the e file. So a non-blocked, the rook went over, and castles. And we're going to get sort of a, OK, there's not a whole lot to talk about here. But in a sort of innocent position in this game, he found a nice, clever tactic that was able to win him the game. Um, so a revealed attack on the queen. Queen went back to c7. Um, OK, we're going to see lots of trades. And then maybe we're going to shake our hands and go home. Um, so he took. All right, very boring stuff. Yep, OK, put the rooks there. Let's trade. But g3 is actually a mistake. And OK, this seems like such an innocent position. What could happen here? Like, let's trade our rooks and you know, let's shake our hands. You know, very drawish. Three on three, three on three. Yeah, you know, both minor pieces are pretty active. What's the problem? So here I will stop for a minute and challenge the audience. And you can pause at home if you need some more time here to think. Um, what clever little tactic did Anand find in this position? So queen a5 is on the right track. OK, so you made two threats. You're threatening to take here, and you're threatening the knight. So this is definitely on the right track. Um, but in order to save them both, I guess I could move my knight to like e3. But I can also just trade, and now I have time to move my knight. Um, I'll have to make sure this works, but I could also just go to some safe square. Um, so that is definitely the right idea. But let's see if we can execute it a little, a little more accurately. Yep. So rook takes. OK, rook has to take. And now queen a5. OK, so a double attack. And I guess white must have missed this. OK, he does have an OK move here, though. It's not all totally lost yet. 97. So the king moved over to f8. I'm threatening your rook. I'm threatening your knight. And here, white made the massive losing blunder. It's already quite bad for white because your knight is trapped in there. So it's very likely that I'm going to win your knight. But here, white played rook e3. OK, a better move was protecting the knight. And black is just a lot better because that knight is trapped. But there's no immediate way to just go win it. Uh, one funny mistake would be to go here. Because, yeah, check. And then I take your rook. Um, and OK, if this queen moves away somewhere, then maybe I'm giving you access to f5. So OK, I'm just better because you're trapped. And I might be able to slowly round up the knight. Um, also, a funny mistake would be to put your rook here and then still allow that check, because then the queen's coming down here. Um, so there's no direct way to actually win it. but. Uh, in the game, he played rook e3. And all right, now that piece is going to be lost. OK, but accuracy is still required. Rook to e8. Um, 
and here he was able to win the piece. And we'll show the rest of the game, but it's, okay, from here, black is just winning, and Ananda is good at winning these positions. Um, but it just goes to show, even in seemingly innocent positions where it doesn't seem like much is going on, well, there can actually be quite a lot of tactics, so you have to be really careful. And sometimes people play you know, boring chess with the idea that sometimes people actually do sort of fall asleep over the board and they you know, don't look for tactics and then they can really pop out at you. So that was a very interesting game by Anand. And we will go back. So, okay, so this is possible in the queen to b3 line. How far back do we want to go? All right, let's go all the way back to this decision. And tonight we're looking at taking queen takes. And now let's focus on the main line. So for the rest of the lecture, we're going to look at, at the main line. Here we go. Um, and the basic setup for black is going to be knight to d7. We're thinking at some point of taking on c4 and playing the move e5. We almost always get the e5 break in as black. Those, there are games, you know, you can't play c5 sometimes. But uh, moving the e pawn makes a lot of sense because then we can get this guy out on its natural diagonal. Um, you know, we want to open it up. We got two bishops, so that's the typical plan. We're going to take at some point and push. And often, we're actually going to uh, fianchetto our bishop. So we'll see black play g6 and bishop g7 in a lot of these lines. Um, and OK, for white. Uh, you almost always play bishop to d3. You have to be sort of quick here as white. So any slow moves, black can just continue with this plan, g7, bishop g7, castle. Um, so yeah, if you're too slow, then I'll just get on with my business. So they almost have to accept the fact that they're going to lose one tempo here. g6, castles, bishop g7. Um, and this is sort of a, a critical position for this variation. And from here, we're actually going to look at quite a lot of moves. So there's at least five moves in this position. And uh, you know that might be a lot for some people. It's like, I'm not going to study five lines of theory to play this position. But it's actually quite easy to play black in these types of positions, because it's always the same. You castle and play e5, and then play the position from there. So we're going to see black does almost the same thing in any, anything that white does. But there are some differences, so we're going to look at a couple of the moves. Um, well, first, I think maybe we should look at just the straightforward move, e4. OK, this is sort of a move that I wanted to play. I have a chance to play it. And if this was a great move, then OK, white would just crush black. However, there's one thing that happens now, and we're going to see it in the game. After we play a move, e5, we're going to, if, you know, if they play d5, we're going to be able to gain a tempo on the bishop and then pin this knight. And that's the, one of the big reasons that black can actually get a very acceptable position is if we ever go here and double the pawns. Because then uh, when we, we get there, we'll see that end games actually can be good for black. So after e4, e5, that's going to be the answer to any time they play e4 in these types of positions. d5, knight b6. White keeps his bishop on a very active diagonal, and bishop to g4. And this is sort of the reason e4 was the main line for a long time, but it, you know, it works out to be very good for black if we just get to take on f3. Everything is at least equal. Um, we'll just show a quick sample continuation. At some point, we'll double the pawns. And uh, a very boring way to play is to put one of your rooks on the c file. Those are drawish lines, but that's possible. Um, often you end up in these types of positions with a weak C pawn. Um, so something like this can happen. And if all the pieces come off the board, it's actually black that might be quite happy in a king pawn endgame. Because it's going to be a lot easier for me to go up here and attack your weaknesses than it is for you to go all the way over here to win my weak pawn. Um, so black's happy if we trade all the pieces. And OK, but for now, white has the more active pieces. So all in all, it's sort of a balanced position that can be played. OK, but if e4 isn't the most testing move, coming back to this position, um, what to do? Well, the two most popular moves, and we're going to look at them a little bit later, are rook c1 and rook e1. 
They both have some dangerous ideas attached to them. Um, but just for fun, let's look at this move, b4. So this is a completely different strategy for white. White intends to clamp down on the queen side, a4, a5. And uh, I'm just going to prevent you from ever moving your queen side pawns and try to get some pressure on the queen side. And there's a very interesting game, uh, Stefansson versus Magnus Carlsen from 2007. And this game is going to feature a very speculative sacrifice against Carlsen. Um, and it was quite dangerous, but Carlsen was able to navigate his way. We'll see if the audience can defend as well as Carlsen does. Uh, and we'll check out this game. OK. So castle, and the plan is a4. We get our break in, e5. That's what we're always trying to do. a5. OK, and lots of patience was exercised. All right, so white has an isolated pawn. So a lot of this is going to be fighting for control over d5. So the rook goes here. In the future, he can play knight to f8, bishop to e6, try to trade the light squared bishops. Uh, will white ever get to play the move d5? That's sort of one of the big questions. And bishop to e6. Um, OK. So it doesn't look like this weakness is going to go away anytime soon. Look at a to d1. So here he traded and played knight e6. Um, so now there's a pin here, so we'll take your knight if we can take and take your knight. Um, OK, the knight goes to e5. And after queen f5, this is the interesting moment. And one time, I, was, I played a tournament. And uh, OK, I played somebody like ridiculously high rated. And uh, at one point, they put a knight on e5. And then they took on f7. And I, was, I didn't see it coming. And then one of my friends said, yeah, when they put a knight on e5, they want to take on e7. So now whenever I see a knight there, I'm always thinking about sacks on f7. And that must have been what this player was thinking about, because in this position, the knight took on f7. So when they put a knight on e5, they want to take on f7. Um, and this poses a very interesting question to black. So obviously, if we take with the queen, we lose a pawn. Um, or we can take with the king and defend our knight. And here I want to see if the, the audience can play like Carlson. This sacrifice should not work, and Carlson figured it out. But uh, what would you guys do in this position? King. King takes was played, yes. A very brave move. So you have to have everything well calculated. And it is possible to play this move, but miss this idea. Rook e3. And we begin to think, uh oh, here comes rook to f3. However, now white is completely losing. But prove it. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's interesting because another question I, I'll ask the class this general question too. When you're playing a higher rated player, because I had some people were discussing this. Should you, when you're playing you know, Magnus Carlsen, do a speculative sacrifice? And some people have said, well, no, he's so good. I mean, he's going to calculate it right, and he's going to get it right. And other people are like, well, that's the only chance you ever have to beat him. So what would, if you guys are playing Magnus Carlsen, would you have taken on f7 and then made him solve this? Or would you be like, no, he's so good, and I'll try to outplay him in a normal way? And the answer is you just lose no matter what you do. So. <laughs> Yeah, if you yeah, if you get even close to a draw, yeah, a lot of people would be happy with almost drawing Carlson. All right, so we have a this is quite a tough one. I don't think it's it's easy to find this this next move. So this seems like a very tempting move, bishop to f6. Because now if they go here, and I'll go there, 
Um, well, I protected it along the F file. However, this should result in a draw. So instead of winning, now you're going to draw. You should do this over and over. If you go here, um, let's see. It was like here. I think here. I don't know. So somehow I just keep attacking your queen. Where do you want? Do you want to do something different? Where did you want to go with her? Rook takes here. Okay, but we had so white. Uh huh. You want to play rook takes here? Am I not winning lots of stuff? So I want some material there. So we do have to be careful. Um, but with best play, this should actually just be a draw. We can just move our queens, and I'll just keep attacking it. But it is, obviously, it's a very tempting option. So if nothing else, I can play that. And if white wants a draw, they can get a draw. So if we put ourselves in Carlson's position, you know, we're 1 to 200 points higher rated than our opponent. We really want to win. We want to find the winning move. So good thing, you know, we got a 2200 rated player in the audience. So maybe we'll be able to get this one right now. Uh, it's black to play and find a very difficult winning move. The bishop can take on d4 now. And it did. And after this, do you see the idea? Just blunder your queen. Yeah, maybe Carlson just blundered here. And so there's a, a really fantastic idea in this position. So again, you got to find this move. And we're about to see something, something really cool about this position. Bishop takes f2. That's your, that's your idea? I'll take back. Yeah, I guess either way, but I'll take back this way. Just messing around. That was funny. What do you want to do? Pawn to b5. Even though I'm taking you with check if I want. Yeah. Eh. OK. I'll take on passant, so I'm still threatening your queen. You can do better. Queen takes f3. That was played. Let's see if we, we see the idea now. We're getting closer to the very interesting aspect about this position. If it weren't for this move, this whole combination wouldn't work. So you had to see this in advance if you actually wanted to play this over the board. Bishop to f2. Bishop to f2. What's the idea? We trade rooks. Or... Did I win? Because I've got a queen and you got a rook. So not quite. Not quite. So this is going to be the, the beautiful idea right here. Bishop takes c3. That's the idea. OK. Yeah, he exchanged the rooks. And now you're in a very dangerous position here as white. The problem is you can't take the bishop. So in the game, he played f4, which doesn't help him. If you take the bishop, not knight f4 just yet. Let's throw this in first. So we do everything with check. Check. Only move. 92. So that's the beautiful tactic in the position. So let's rewind just for one second. Let's see it again. All right, so after this sacrifice, so he had to see all of that in advance. All right, yeah, I just play bishop d4. Just take your rook. I take your knight, and you can't take back. All right, he played f4, which doesn't help. And then Carlson played the funniest move. Yeah, rook d4, because you still can't take my bishop. And here, white resigned. Because again, if you're, it's exactly the same. You have a new option. So if you're the same fork, you played f4 to give yourself this square. 
but that's not going to help you either. Um, <laughs> so a very beautiful idea here by Carlson, very well calculated. Um, and so, OK, that's, if you sack against Carlson, you lose. If you don't sack, you lose. You know, pick your poison. It's too hard, yeah. How many moves can you last? How many moves can you last? OK, so castles bishop g7. And we come back to this position. OK, we've seen e4, we've seen b4. Um, before we come to the two main moves, let's take a quick peek at the move queen to c2. And one of the ideas is to start getting some pressure on the king side. So sometimes we can do lots of stuff. We can use the e4 square for our knight. Um, and we can get a line like this. The bishop goes back to b3. And you do have to always be a little careful here as black. e5. Knight g3 is an idea. Um, one of the ideas. The reasons for this is if the king ever goes to h7, sometimes knight h5 is an idea in this position due to the pin on the g pawn. Um, so king h8, just getting out of all the pins. And at some point, you'll release the tension like this. And you get an interesting position where perhaps our bishops can shine on the open board. Perhaps white can get you know some immediate pawn storms going. You get very interesting positions, but they should all be fine for black. Um, so that's as far as we'll go on that line. And let's, get, let's just get right to the main, main stuff here. OK, so after bishop g7, we'll look at the main line, which is rook to c1. So historically, this is the most popular, although rook e1 is becoming more popular. Um, and there's an interesting idea associated with the fact that the rook is now protecting the bishop. So after castles, e4. So black plays the obvious move. e5. And now d5. In a recent game, Wesley So played rook to b8. So that's a, a good way to try to play for uh, a win with black. The main line, however, is just knight to b6. And here we'll see the small trick attached to rook to c1. In this position, we don't have to retreat the bishop. We can take on c6. The idea is if you take here, knight d5, and let's make a funny blunder for everybody practicing their forks. Um, so that's sort of the main idea. OK, so instead you take with this pawn. And all of the top, top games, they play a few moves. And all of it's a lot of draws. Uh, you have to go way down the list of like, if you sort it by highest rated players, you got to go way down the list to find a decisive game. Because OK, black has the two bishops. I'm thinking of bishop to g4 a lot of the times. I do have this weakness, so white can you know, pile up on my c pawn, and he has something to attack. Um, so most games do actually end up in a draw in these positions. OK, bishop e2, and um, OK. Something like this is just fine for both sides. Um, you both have your chances. All right, let's get to the good stuff here. There was more to say there, but let's just get to the good stuff. OK, I want to look at this move, rook to e1, which was played in a very important match to me, because it was played in 2012 which is the same year my son was born. So OK, this was played about a month before he was born, and it was the last time I could actually watch a full tournament. But uh, so for that reason, I knew, OK, I'm just going to watch this whole thing. Um, so I remember all of these games. So this game really s stood out to me. It's, well, it's important to me, so that it's my class, and show what I want. Um, Rook to e1 actually has an interesting idea. This is from the, the match between Kramnik and Aronian. Uh, it was played in 2012. And the idea here is actually quite interesting, this move rook e1. Um, I'll show you it in action so we can, we can get the idea. OK, so castles, e4. So you play the obvious move, e5. Again, d5. And now, if knight to b6, 
Um, if the, you guys you want to do this, because we saw on the other line, yeah, we just double the pawns, and then the end games will be fine for us. The idea is rookie three. So that's the idea behind uh, this move order, which is, OK, kind of a funny idea, because now yeah, I, I don't really want to take you. Um, so that's, that's sort of the whole point here. In the game, rook d8 was played instead, lining up with the queen. Uh, and rook e3 was played. OK, without bishop to g4, he still played rook e3. b5. And this is a very interesting decision. And it probably wasn't hard for him because there was a game play just earlier that year that had this. And instead of sort of passively defending with this solid structure, black takes the action right to white before white actually has a time to get a big initiative here. So here he's sort of forcing the play, and it should work out pretty well for black, as this game will demonstrate. OK, so white took. All right, my point was to take your bishop. Um, knight to d5. And here we saw a novelty. So really, it's sort of Kramnik that's uh, tricking his opponent by playing this variation, because both of them actually play the anti-Moscow quite a lot. Um, but after this next move, he had to actually start thinking. And then Aronian got to play. He, had to, like, he didn't have to think as much. He was already prepared for this, even though uh, he, he probably wasn't expecting it. And he played this. New move, queen to e6. Earlier, the move queen to d6 had been played. Um, it's a game Muzichuk had black here against Ushinina. And you know those people? You don't? It was like a women's world championship or something. So no, no idea. All right, well, these two people, they were watching that. So they had probably already seen this. And it worked out well for white in that game. So this might have been what Kramnik had expected. Um, and so one of the things that happened, we'll just show a couple moves here. In this position, you'll notice this knight never really got challenged. And you have this weakness here. Where'd my colors go? A weakness here on c4. So here white was just better in this game. Um, we'll just go a few more moves. And OK, obviously white is is doing very well here. All right, so Ronian was very well prepared. And he played this new move. And the idea is when you take here, I'll take back with my rook. And I'll play bishop to b7, challenging your knight. So here was actually Kramnik that had to start thinking. OK, he's going to go get the pawn. And we're going to trade everything and get to this end game. And this endgame is actually quite good for black. So this was a very good preparation for him. You have the better minor piece. And you got the four on three. You're looking at moves like f5 and e4. Um, looks very easy to play. So all right, white is, white's already got a problem. And here he played a very interesting move. In OK, this protector stuff. Now f5 is coming, so g4. All right, king h7. Now another interesting decision. Play g5. Um, OK, he's trying to, to force matters here. Check. I have to go back. You are stuck with these permanent weaknesses now. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, knight move is associated with another bad move that he's about to play. So this didn't work out for him, which was f4. So this almost works out for white, but it allows me to play rook b8. And after takes, takes. Uh, black is just too active here. Okay, He prevents the second rook from coming in. Take on a2. Now I'm up a pawn. e6. OK, and so white is trying to liquidate 
trying to get to a drawn end game here. But after rook f5. Eh, I don't want to trade with you. We get a position like this. And, okay, black is still better here. Check. Um, and so what ended up happening is we chase this guy around a little bit. Bishop f8. I believe it's here that he actually plays a losing move. Um, well, it was quite bad for him, but now it's it's even worse. Because uh, after you attack the knight, you have an easily winning move. And bishop to d6. So this was just sort of a, a model game, and, and that's where they resigned, of... Um, uh, one person just out-prepared the other player. The rook e1 idea is actually quite interesting. You're planning on playing rook to e3. But as it's sort of shown here, what black should do is take the action right to white, make sure that you challenge the knight that was on d5. And uh, if you do all that right, then you, you're going to get a great game. So this is obviously sort of a more tepid opening. It's not as great as Botvinnik. But come next week, we got the anti-Moscow, which will be even more exciting. So hit like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.